Well, as it was said earlier on the service, I'm just a few weeks away from transferring to another church, and I'm preparing for one of the biggest changes in my life after 17 years of serving as your associate pastor. It is while preparing for this exit that I find myself thinking about how it all began a good 24 years ago. Not surprisingly, I have too much to say and too many people to thank. So I have decided to begin my farewell address one week early and offer you the first of a two-part series. Won't you please pray with me? May the words from my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace and peace be with you on this day. Over the years serving here, I have uh, taken youth and adults of this church on many trips. We've been to Cuba, Haiti, New York City, Seattle, West Virginia, Virginia, Indiana, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, and at least five different regions in the state of Florida. Traveling as a group always has a different purpose, but a common goal of any church trip is that the people may form bonds when they are together. And the bond is created by spending more hours together than usual, by walking together through unfamiliar territory, by laughing and at times crying together. The bond gives us a sensation of belonging, that we are no longer alone with the struggles of life. As we all know, it's the bond that creates community and provides the sense of belonging And in my case, the bonds I have formed with you have given me some of the best years of my life. To belong is a very important need that must be met in the journey towards self-actualization. It's the third stage of development in Maslow's hierarchy of needs and a necessary step before developing a healthy self-esteem. For most growing adolescents, this need is met through their family and through the social networks in school and beyond. As many of us know, my ministry here at Gables UCC has been marked by youth ministries from the very beginning. And I know firsthand how important it is for teenagers to have a spiritual home and to know that they belong to this community. What does belonging to Gables UCC do for a young person? Believe it or not, Every year, I have to sell it to parents who are not sure if their children should participate in youth group. I tell them that belonging to youth group and uh, participating actively in it provides a new layer of awareness of relationships and resources that will help the growing teenagers overcome the challenges of an increasing dysfunctional and schizophrenic society. This statement could be expanded very easily to a description of all of our ministry groups, young and old. To belong is more than just a step in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It is an ongoing need that eventually becomes ingrained into our identity. I am proud to say that for almost 24 years, my wife and I have belonged to this church, 17 of which I have the pleasure to serve as your associate pastor. I have experienced in my own life, in my own family, how belonging to this church has provided for us more than we could have ever had imagined. I first came as a visitor in 1991 with my wife Maria back when I used to be a school teacher and I had no idea that I would switch professions and become a pastor. Maria and I were running away from the Catholic Church and we were determined. <laughs> it's, it seems I'm not the only one. And we were determined to baptize our son in a church that felt comfortable. In 1991, nobody used words like inclusive, progressive, and liberal, at least not down here. And as it turns out, that is exactly what we were looking for. Baptizing Carlos on this very altar became a pivotal moment for our family. It changed everything. It was on that day that we met Mary Eaton, a smiling woman that you may know now through the fair trade store. She recognized me as her daughter's math teacher, and she quickly set out to make me feel at home. 
I was wondering and I was suspicious about that because it turns out that I was the only teacher that gave her daughter an A. <laughs> At least in that year. I'm sure she got other A's later. <clears throat> 1991 was the era for big hair. You should have seen the choir back then. <laughs> Joseph Spencer had hair like a Motown artist. <laughs> and as I think back to 1991 and being a young, idealistic father, I have to say that it was some of the best years of my life. It was in those early years that I met Mark Hart in one of our pews, right around there where Steve and uh, Lynn Sparling are seating. He too was looking for a spiritual home. And I remember asking him, um, you know, was he new to the area? And then he started to ask me questions about this church. I don't know exactly what I said to him, but whatever I said did not scare him away. As I enjoyed this past Thursday's concert here in this sanctuary, I was thinking about Mark and how he took a successful music ministry of this church and grew it to a whole new level. And that was a good 24 years ago. It feels like a dream. Maria and I stood out like a sore thumb in this church. Not only we were one of the youngest people here, but it was also a predominantly Anglo church. And Maria and I were one of the first Miami Cubans who wanted something different than the Roman Catholic Church. And by accident, we found ourselves here. It wasn't long before we fell in love with this church. It was here where I decided to become a pastor. Those were the years of post Hurricane Andrew, and the reconstruction of Miami-Dade County. That gave our church a whole new purpose. It was a hands-on era, and it promoted a proactive spirit in the congregation. Just about everyone in the congregation was wielding a hammer or filling up boxes for the relief efforts that were going on throughout the county. I have many memories of working shoulder to shoulder with members of our congregation. It was a it was a time that stands out in my memory as one of the best years in my life. Now, it may not seem like a big deal now, but back then, the church took a risk by hiring this Cubanito. I was the first Cuban who held a ministry position in the UCC nationwide, and it really must have been a gutsy move, because everybody knows that us Cubanitos always have a Telemundo dancing girl at home and that it definitely would not be long before the samba rhythms would invade our Germanic hymns. <laughs> and then, of course, we have such a different way of greeting. We're always kissing each other on the cheek and have these long hugs. That, of course, would change the passing of the peace to a long makeout session. <laughs> and the way that we worship coffee puts at risk the fact that communion wine could be replaced by Bustero coffee. <laughs> yes, it was a gamble. It was a gamble, but there's nothing like a crisis to create an opportunity. It was 1995, and the previous director of children and youth ministries had taken the youth on an annual Peace River canoe trip. It ended up being the canoe trip from hell. Some of you have already heard this story in all of its embellishments, so I'll skip straight to the end. By the end of the trip, two young girls were lost on the river and later found. A group of boys got stoned, and I don't mean in the biblical sense. And at least one girl had to take a pregnancy test when she got back home. Yes, those were the good old days. And so when they had a change in leadership and they offered me the position of youth pastor, I jumped right for it. <laughs> Several people from that era are still with us here today, and I still remember how much I enjoyed myself back then. Truly, those years and those first few youth groups that I ministered to stand out in my mind as some of the best years in my life. Once I was ordained into the ministry, I went to serve a community in Homestead. I was there for almost two years, but another crisis in this church created another opportunity for me. It was January 1999, and the leadership of this church called me back to serve, and this time as a pastor. I returned to the church to begin what would be a 17-year run. Back then, I was the most junior member of an impressive ministerial team. 
I was given the charge to oversee the pastoral ministries. And with that, a very talented group of people who called themselves the Stephen Ministers. I had the blessing of visiting many members of this community at the hospital, of praying by their bedside. I have many tender memories of visiting countless church members, including the indestructible Jesus Samblas, a man who over the years would teach me how to identify a good bottle of wine. And yes, back in those days, I would have drank just about anything, even Trader Joe wine. And now I'm a verifiable wine snob. Jesus holds the record for getting pastors drunk, including the late Dr. Marcus Borg, who would not stop drinking port at the San Blas residence the night before he was to preach from this pulpit. It still stands out as one of the best sermons he ever gave. The years 1999 through 2004 were transformational years for this church. In my opinion, we went from being a church that had thought progressive ideals to a church that lived out its progressive ideals. It was a time for extreme creativity, which empowered me to develop an important skill set to design, develop, and implement programs. This was a time when we did strategic planning like if it was going out of style. I worked with some very good people and with very good minds, like Andrew Hutchinson, Gail Sosby, Jesus Samblas, Joan Robertson, Doris Johnson, Carol Craig, Roger Dunwell, and Leone Hermantin. My relationship with Leone was a joyful and ongoing experiment to see if we, a non-Haitian, predominantly Anglo church in Coral Gables, could do mission in Haiti that was sustainable and empowering of the Haitian people. I have such fond memories of Leone and Carol during our early years, trying to figure out how to do mission without falling into the trap of poverty and disaster tourism. Our time spent in the Central Plateau with Project Metashare created many learning experiences while still promoting a spirit of laughter and joy. I look at those days and I think that they were some of the best years in my life. I have to tell you a funny story about Leone. And I don't know if she's here or if she's running out the door, but it turns out that whenever we traveled with Leone, people would know her. If we were at the Miami commissioners meeting, Leone was friends with every single commissioner. If we were at a restaurant, the beach, the airport, you name it, Leone would have people at all of those places. Carol once remarked that Leone knew everyone and everyone knew Leone. So in the year 2007, when candidate Obama came to town to promote his campaign, a bunch of us went over there to see him. And of course, I went to go see candidate Obama along with every other Obama mama in town. And who do I see up in the stage standing just a few feet away from the soon-to-be president? Leone. <laughs> That's right. So I turned to a gentleman next to me, and I pointed at Leone, and I asked, excuse me, do you know who that person is up there on the stage? Well, I don't really know who that tall black man is, he said to me. But the tall woman standing next to him is Leone Hermantine. <laughs> Friends, all joking aside, doing mission in Haiti expanded my understanding of how people living in abject poverty depend on God for some of the most basic needs in life, hope and comfort. The late and great theologian Marcus Borg, who personally graced this pulpit half a dozen times, described God as being within and among us in the same manner that water is within and among fish. As water is to fish, God is to us. The water that flows inside the fish, providing the life source necessary for the fish to exist, is the same water that's outside the fish. The fish does not differentiate between water within and water without. Likewise, the force we call God is within and all around us. God is not only in our hearts, but also in the nature and in the people that are around us. God is inside us and everywhere else. Some people would say that this is very Buddhist of me. And the answer is yes, but it's also very Christian. Consider this morning's scripture from the perspective of Dr. Borg. For I am convinced 
that nothing in all creation could separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you see yourself swimming in the waters of God? That is truly the challenge. That is the challenge of every person that walks in through those doors. That is the challenge of every pastor to go ahead and make it feel that God is in every single person. Because if we could recognize God in our neighbors, God in those that sit next to us, even God in those whom we are not very fond of, then we just might begin to start treating ourselves and each other better. It is this metaphor and this image of God that has created the deepest impact in my relationship with God. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Had it not been for my colleague and friend, Megan Smith, who created the Theologian in Residence program along with the Spiritual Formation Board, and had it not been for Lori, who year after year encouraged Megan to go forward and make it happen, I may not have learned this beautiful metaphor and image of God. So I'm going to call my daughter Natalia forward to be my assistant. I'm going to ask for Megan and Lori to come and stand here in the center. I'm going to embarrass you in front of everybody. I am asking Lori and Megan to accept a gift on behalf of this church. As you can see, she's coming forward with some fish, and the fish represent who we are, and it's a mobile, and this is something that I went ahead and got, and I think we could hang it somewhere, if you'd like, um, <laughs> or not. <laughs> and it says there, God within, God without, God all around. The words from Marcus Borg himself. Go ahead, Nathan, I give it to them. Friends, it has been a long and joyful journey that has brought me to this new stage in life. I leave full of love and gratitude in my heart, for you have provided a place where I could belong and my family could call home. I leave you in a few days full of love and gratitude in my heart for providing for me the best years of my life. More importantly, I leave you with a sense of belonging that has expanded and rippled out to every person who walks in through those doors. For regardless of how the Spirit of God may gather or scatter us in life, here the love of God abides, providing a spiritual home where you will always know that you belong. Amen and amen.